Hannah, you got to do something with that oh. beer, bro. I know, Hi. dude. It's outrageous. Hey, hey Hannah. What's up with that? Hi. Hey, you have nice these things called you. scissors. You can, you know, I don't know if you've heard of those. I'm getting grief from my executive producer, Hannah, about my beard. Oh, okay. He I looks mean, like the, what was uh, in uh, Rudolph? In what? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know, the, the monster. Oh, yeah. The, um, oh, what's his name? I see his face, too. Oh, There's my God. He's, like, he's oh, the right Yeti. Yeah, he's a like Yeti. Branded. Yeah, he's a Yeti. So how you been, Hannah? You know, good, good enough. Okay, are you in L.A.? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. As far as you know. Okay. Um, yeah, can't, can't complain. Yeah. Have you been getting out at all? Like to the beach, I hope. Um, haven't been to the beach. Mm. Um no. Nope. Lots of time in inside. Yeah. Um but yeah, yeah. I mean things are getting kind of crazy here. I don't know. Oh in LA? Yeah. Yeah. In terms of like numbers and everything. So Wow. Yeah. What part of town are you in? They're blowing it. In LA, Los Angeles County. Um, oh. But they, yeah, I mean, they reopened everything and now they're, they've closed everything again. So, oh. um, you know, not a lot of leaving the house currently, but yeah, eventually, one day, we're hoping. Yeah. One are, day, you, yeah. are you all in Seattle or different places? Uh, different places. Uh, William and I are in the Bay Area. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. I'm up in uh, Sonoma County, just over the county line in Petaluma. Yeah. And William's down in the Pacifica, south of the city. Oh, so nice. Yeah. I'm jealous. That's, that does sound pretty incredible. Yeah. yeah. That's so nice. Do you, is that somewhere you're, you are normally? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I moved from Seattle about a year and a half ago uh, down oh here God. in California. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, like it? time to move. Yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable anywhere on the West Coast. I've spent so much yeah. time in all the different cities, but um, it just felt like it was time to move on from Seattle, given Queen Anne had changed so much. Yeah. I've been there 25 years, and uh, I was ready for a new horizon. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you, this is a place you've been to before, but you've never lived. Yeah, I, I've spent time here, you know, all over the Bay Area. I made my first uh, film which uh, William was, was uh, worked with us on around the fire, like all over the, uh, the Bay Area. Nevada, hey, just south of here. You're supposed to cover up the markings on the police cars when you drive them. Like, I know. I there is know. that. There was that. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Connor, are you on, man? Yeah, you're between yeah. one fern. Is that your motif you're going for? By what? Yeah. You're between one fern. Um, yeah. Yeah, you got to, you know. It's, I you only know, have one everything. One of all the plants, but you know, trying to expand. Hey, Connor, are you on? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay. Do you guys not see me? No, no, no. video, bro. Oh. Uh, might be. I have it uh, just <laughs> set to not do video when I join a call because I just have this paranoia that I'm going to be called and my computer is going to pick up for myself when I'm like walking around naked or something. So I forgot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's always yeah. that fear. Exactly. There is that. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, you guys. Really appreciate it. I'm psyched that we could catch up, um, especially because logistically it was not in the stars for us to connect uh, on the uh, uh, the other cast call. Um, so, you know, here we are. I guess, like, let's kick it off just so um, everybody can get a sense of um, who's who on the call and let us know, you know, who you are and what character um, you played in the film. Yeah. Ladies first. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm Hannah Horton. And I played Noob Girl, but her real name's Jen. Yeah, true. As we learn in the film. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are tone and levels there. <laughs> Connor? Uh, and I play Link. Awesome. And uh, who's, the, who's the other dude with the mohawk? Who are, who are you? What's, what's your Look role, how bro? How crooked this shit is, dude. I can't cut my own hair. That's such a COVID haircut. Huh. Uh, I'm hey, William, you guys. Hi. Yeah, right on. Wonderful work, by the way. Hey, William. Yeah, you guys were both amazing. Thanks, man. 
much. And it's funny because I was thinking about this call and I was thinking of that in the film, both of your characters probably reach out to David's more than anyone else's, like most overtly. Like there's that one scene with Atsuko, but that's like so jagged. But like the scene, like the scene between both of you in the kitchen with him, like are really affected me a lot because I just watched it again the other night, and I was um, I was thinking about that, and I was, and John told me a little bit because I I wasn't on set, but I was wondering, you know, because I understand David went pretty method with it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. So what was that like? Was was that effective in that you felt um, a little frightened but like trying to reach out or did that did that affect your performance at all or I think I don't want to speak for David because I don't know his process but I think that that was largely um, for David to experience a sense of isolation and disconnect I think that Jager wanted to be careful about him uh, having that feeling of estrangement and not belonging I don't know if it was you, John, maybe can speak to this originally, uh, David Call's choice or Jager's to have him isolate from the rest of the cast. Um, yeah, that was Jager's, Jager's decision, Jager's? I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I hope David was cool with that. Uh, no, we were no. here <laughs> afterwards the day with John. Uh, I don't remember where we were, but we went to a little spot. I feel like we were close to the water. Um, and it was the first time I talked to Dave. He seemed like a really cool guy. I uh, spent right. a lot of time with him, but I don't know him at all. Yeah. On account of him, yeah, as you said, going pretty, I don't know if it's, you know, I feel like method is a word that's thrown around often and I don't know. Yeah, that, yeah well, I mean, that's pretty pedestrian, but. No, I'm not, that's not an accusation of being pedestrian. I just mean that whatever, I, whatever, I don't whatever. know what David would call. He just, he just told me that, that they kept David sort of isolated, which I think adds to his performance, but I think it adds like the scene where like the second time when he asked you like, what's really going on? Mm -hmm. You know, and your character is like, you know, I'm just trying to, to like mean something, you know what I mean? And it's very genuine and stuff. And, and I was just wondering like, what kind of feedback you got off of him? And you know, and it's sort of the same with, with Hannah's character who like reaches out in a friendly way and then he just takes it like all sideways and you know. Well we had um when we were putting the film together William you weren't on set but uh there was like such a need for David to be isolated that we actually rented him his own trailer and he lived in the trailer and like I went in there like maybe a week into filming and it was just like covered with um you know squash beer cans and pizza boxes I was like all right it's happening you know. <laughs> I knew it was happening. So like, go. yeah, there, there you go. From the producer's perspective, it was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to make sure that he's got a place to just, you know, do that. Did he live, did he live there at night? He did not live there at night. He had a, um, an Airbnb, which he would, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically move off to. But I mean, the last shot of the film that he had his champagne shot, I think maybe it was that, that night of the night shoot even. Um, I just, you know, had been wanting to talk to him and connect with him throughout the film, but couldn't because of Jager's instruction. So after his last shot, I just walked up to him and gave him a huge beer, bear hug. And I was like, man, you are back, you know? Um, cause I saw him reach out a few times just for like basic human contact with the crew. And I don't know if it was with other actors, but, um, it got shut down pretty quickly. People were like, you know, crossing their T's and dotting their eyes with him. So that must've been tough. Oh, God. I feel awful now. <laughs> exactly. Like we yeah, watch that go down. Yeah. I I really he was, tried harder. In my head, he was staying with his parents, which had made me feel better. <laughs> but maybe, maybe. no, no, no. He just, I don't know where, I never saw the, uh, the Airbnb. I don't know where it was in town. I don't think it was too far from the U district though. You know, maybe he could even like, you know, walk, you know, from there. So it was just probably all this sort of a, uh, you know, strange sort of shrouded circle of the film and then his existence offset, you know, not seeing anyone else. Was he part of the original cast chat a week or so ago? Did he have anything to say on the matter? Uh, he was he was not part of their original cast chat. Um, he did do one with um, uh, Dr. Adler and myself and Jager, 
where we talked um, at length about um, his preparation for the role in the context of working with David, uh, with Richard Adler, um, because they had, um, they had a lot of, they had one or two meetings without like uh, um, Jager and I. So he really did a deep dive with Dr. Adler on um, what was what in terms of the psychological profiles of, um, you know, people that Richard had seen and studied uh, who were um, murderers. I look forward to hearing. Yeah. So, well, um, go ahead, go William. I was just gonna say that both of you guys' performances, this is, um, really stood out to me, like from the very first time I saw like a rough cut of the film. And, um, and I guess that's why we even got off on that sort of like sidetrack about David is because both of your characters, like just the way that they reach out and just like so authentic too. Like I was really blown away by both of you. And, um, and that's why I was curious about like if, if you were feeding off of that a little bit or, um, you know, if you just have a horrific electronic music pass that you don't want anybody to know about, or I, mean, I do have a pass with electronic music. I, <laughs> I'm not too ashamed of it. Yeah, David was great. I had a blast working with David. Um, I also had a blast working with Hannah and Otsko and the whole cast. I know that we had the frame set up of David being a part, but even within that. It, it seemed like very much like a family operation to yeah. me, having worked on stuff like this, you know? Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's dial the clock back a little bit. I'm, I'm interested in uh, uh, hearing about your perceptions of the film based upon the, um, um, the readings and uh, when uh, we were in the casting process. I think, Connor, you, you read, did you read twice or just once? I can't remember. I think just once. I think I read in... I don't know, like 2001 or something, like way, way, way right. back in the day. It was really early. And I, and I think you, you, uh, you read at the, uh, the SIF Film Center. We were in like the big room upstairs, I think. Does that sound right? You know, yes, yes. In okay. my head, in time, it had become a library because it was just one of those kind of like civic space, right. multi-purpose room things. But the SIF Center sounds like <laughs> yeah. there was books. Yeah. yeah, I just re I remember it so well because you had prepared a melody for Creepy Creepy Lincoln, and you literally performed the entire awesome. song and melody. <laughs> well, you on have top to. It's a desk. song. You can't just like speak the words to a song. Yeah, but but the melody, I just thought, <laughs> wow, like okay, you're also writing a song for your audition. That rules. Uh, you're, I think you're giving me a little too much credit. It was writing a song in the sense that anyone can be like. And I'm picking up my phone. Who's calling me now? It's nobody. I'm just pretending. It's not a song. Uh, well, yeah, it's a little beefier than that, but yeah, yeah. That was another yeah, but, little song for the BTS. Mm -hmm. Well, it worked. And I remember just looking over at Jager and giving him sort of this psychic, you know, handshake, like, okay, Link's here. Cool. You know, yeah. Um, so Hannah, did you read twice for the film or just once? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I came in yeah one time with whoever i think there was a casting did you have a casting person in the room um at all? we we did but she was not i don't think she attended the readings okay um but yeah and then i came in again a second time mm -hmm. and and that was maybe the sag offices yeah 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 because I, I remember as we were like filling out the cast because we did two um sort of casting pushes one was the first push, which you read for Connor, you know, back in the early um, 2000s. And then um, Jager got, got sick and that stopped the whole process down for like almost a year. And then we restarted again and we looked at um, a few of the actors uh, came back and read a second time for us, even though we had, you know, some strong confidence. We didn't know where they would be at with the roles and would it still work. And Jager, you know, Jager had also been through a lot. So we wanted to bring some people back, but um, I think you came to our attention um, through maybe Heidi Walker. Does that sound right, Hannah? Yeah, yeah, that's the casting. Um, yeah. Yeah, just got yeah. it, got the email. Yeah. Yeah, Heidi's great, Heidi, Heidi, Heidi uh, opened the door to a lot of people for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's yeah. definitely someone who I had read for. Yeah, times. she did work with, um, with David Lynch 
on uh, um, his Northwest uh, material. So, you know, we had a lot of confidence in her for sure. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. So um, when you guys sort of, what was the, like, when did you, I know like Connor, you got into rehearsals with Otsko actually in that same space in the SAG um, offices um, before the shooting started. But when did you guys first start getting together and really like connecting as a group? Was it on set? I'll look to Hannah for as much help as she can offer here. I imagine it had to be because those rehearsals were pretty um, limited in scope. I, you know, I don't, I don't think that we had a whole, a full cast rehearsal. I think it was me and it, I don't feel like it was more than three or four people in the room. Um, so I imagine it was in the natural course of bonding that happens on most shoots, especially single location shoots where you're just hanging out with a bunch of relatively similarly aged people um in a house for hours and hours and hours a day yeah yeah i do remember we did a a rehearsal at the sag offices which was i think connor and and otsuko and me and sequoia and maybe someone else but mm. um but i don't think hassan was there um mm. yeah yeah do you remember that connor well I don't. I, I obviously have a memory of doing the movie with Hassan, and so, so suddenly I'm like, was it also at a rehearsal, or am I just imagining being on set with him and then therefore translating into a rehearsal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do remember that was my first time, I mean, meeting everyone, but um, meeting Sequoia and being like, okay, we're going to be basically together, a unit for the rest of this experience, so it clicks and the system. yeah mm -hmm. what was that like having a, a acting buddy on a movie it was great um, he is like... yeah it was really fun because i think yeah i mean there was so much happening and you know i mean it was nice just being around so many people in general like having a big ensemble and everybody on set all the time there's always somebody to talk to but um, like having one person who's your buddy was, was nice and comforting. Was that, do you think that had anything to do with, um, with the, with shooting being, you know, the subject matter of the film? Cause you guys, your characters bring not only levity, but like love, you know, and acceptance and, and, and the good parts of that, of that whole scene that was interrupted. Um, you know, because I know that, like, during production, you know, there was, like, you know, mass shootings that were becoming ubiquitous, and there was a lot of um, them, half, like, major ones happening at, at different inflection points with, um, you know, during production and before and after. Um, but, so did that, like, help you, like, stay, uh, like, positive and keep that, keep that aspect going, like, knowing that it was like this heavy thing in the background? I think, um, yeah, it seems to me like that one of Jager's goals with it was to really show the life of all this community and um, all the lives that were affected by such a tragic event. Um, and yeah, I definitely, that was definitely something I was thinking about on set and beforehand going into it, wondering, you know, it's so heavy and so dark and researching beforehand um, about this specific incident and not knowing how much that would carry in, in, into the set experience. Um, but um, feeling like it was important to show um, the life before. Oh well, yeah, and it, re and it really comes through, you know, and part of that is just the way that it's laid out narratively with, you know, the actual violence happening in the first 90 seconds, you know, and then like the whole flashback motifs and stuff. But the, you know, the vibe of both your characters is, um, you know, it just reminds me of people I know and people I've met that are like cool, like that, 
will talk people down from a bad trip or whatever, you know, and uh, it's, um, it's no small feat to accomplish that around such, um, you know, such an awful thing that happened, you know, to, uh, to show, you know, the community and the love and the acceptance that was there to begin with, you know. Yeah, we spent a lot of time during the development process in the script, you know, focusing on um, uh, the the scenes and the chemistry between characters and trying to create, you know, um, individual scenes and sequences to sort of, you know, give different characters opportunities to, you know, serve the narrative and also serve the group um, as ravers and to sort of create different facets and dimensions of that um, rave group. And like that was like a real sort of quadrant of work that we did in developing the script. The, the work with um, David's character and to a degree his interactions to a degree with other um, uh, rave characters were also like another sort of world that we spent a lot of time in uh, in terms of talking and then, and then developing. But um, your scene in particular, uh, Hannah, with uh, um, David Call in the kitchen, the murder in the kitchen, where you're talking to him about your experience at yeah. the uh, um, at the rave, um, and you're and you're super high on on Molly. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, was not aware of the lens choices. I didn't know how close the cinematographer was on you for that sequence when we shot it. So the first time I saw your performance was in the dailies, and um, I remember sitting in the edit edit bay. And looking at uh, um, how Mike had framed you in close up, and I just I was rooting for you so big time, moment to moment, because I was not on set and I didn't see it, and I was like, oh my god, like any any like moment of uh, inauthentic like acting will just you know not work in this, you know. And so I was right there with you, and you absolutely delivered it. It was just an amazing freaking scene. Yeah, it was. I also fawn over that scene. I have said that. Yeah, it's it out like it was awesome. Yeah, fucking great. Exactly, Connor. <laughs> That's very, very nice. Um, now you have to say something equally nice about the three of us. Yeah, all of your scenes. All of your scenes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Please don't. This is your beard is much nicer than John's. Yeah, you just wait, young man. Um, I, you know, I, and also, I do and really. Also, think you, I'm sorry. I was just going to keep complimenting Hannah because I, I do think that you're very, 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 very good. Yeah, dude. All for real. Like, the That's first time I, I saw it, I was just like, wow, she's fucking amazing. And the, you know, and the, and the scene at the rave, too. In fact, that when we were talking about poster ideas, I really like the idea of, um, you know, you, you and Sequoia. I think it was you and Sequoia. And and you're down the hall from David, you know what I mean? And he's literally the wallflower at that point. Uh, um, you know, before you walk up and, you know, and when they cut the trailer, which I thought was super impactful and it ends with you saying like, you know, uh, you know, it, like if you need somebody to talk to, I'm going to be right over here. Like, you know, that whole scene, that was really, really awesome. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Super genuine, you know. Thank you. It's a lot of nice, <laughs> a lot of nice things. Um, but I do remember feeling like the, in reading the script, like the character made sense in a lot of ways. Like the fact that she's not, you know, it was easy to come into not knowing much about the rave world and her not knowing much about the rave world. Um, Ironically. Yeah, just connect, just in the way that it was written. Um, yeah, made it, made it feel really easy. Beautiful. Yeah, like, I I remember specifically now in the development process when that uh, that word maggoty came came out <laughs> in your writing and how I just knew that was going to be a victory. I was like maggoty. I was like, oh, that's so good. So good. Yeah. It was fun. Um, so Connor, I was like flashing on a, a couple of your scenes and the one that just popped into my head was, um, uh, I don't even know if it was in the script because I don't remember this line, but when you're um, downstairs with um, the crew and you guys are uh, in the basement with David. Mm -hmm. um, there's a moment where you say to him that you're gonna give him uh, uh, the hard sell, you know, and you yeah. grab his hand, you know? And like, was that, was that in the script or did you improvise that? 
That was not, I think, uh, much to Jager's chagrin. Uh, very, very little <laughs> that had, had come from the script, which I tried to find a balance of being uh, deferential and respectful to his words. But uh, um, I don't know if he wanted to put a shorter leash on me. He could have, and he didn't. Yeah. So he said a bunch of stuff that, uh, yeah, that's just a, a, a favorite phrase of mine. Yeah, no, that was just so, that popped right into my head and I could see you reaching out and grabbing his hand, you know, in the frame and it was just set up visually. It's so good because you're, you're just literally, you know, reaching out to him and uh, uh, ultimately Rob sort of the way they cut that scene, Rob and Jager, um, they cut back to him and his sort of, um, you know, his, uh, it's almost like he can't even uh, believe or take in, you know, probably because of the state he's at chemically also you know, what you're actually trying to, you know, deliver to him, what you're saying, which is that like, you should not be ashamed of what's going on with you, you know, like this is part of the human experience. And, uh, you know, it's not about um, your uh, sexual preference in this situation. You know, it's about um, identification with, uh, um, you know, with masculine or feminine. And we have those qualities in us as we well know, you know, every man and every woman shares them. So I just thought that that was, you know, was so cool. And the other, the other scene, and William brought this up actually, that I thought was so great, especially because of the way Mike caught it, um, was, um, and, and to me, it was so moving to see this moment, like the first time I watched the DCP through, I was on my own down in LA at Simple DCP, and uh, I was in their screening room. And when uh, we get to the moment where um, for the second time you're saying to David, you know, are you all right? You know, and you kind of look at him because that's the moment when the whole story and the narrative could ultimately turn on a dime if he responds to you right there and says, no, I'm not all right, right? I got shit going on or there's something happening. And your character is at a spot. You're at a place where, you know, you can go there if he responds to you, but he, he ultimately doesn't. And so that's sort of the tragic pivot for me. Um, you know, and when you're developing this, you see it on paper and you have a feeling about how it will work or how it won't work. And that moment there really sort of expanded off the page into something I hadn't anticipated emotionally. Like it really hit me um, because that's the moment where, you know, he just, he doesn't turn the corner on it. And, um, and then uh, we're just back to uh, sort of the, uh, you know, the business of the narrative. Well, and it's the second time that he touches him. Did you write, you write in his arm, mm -hmm. which maybe gets him to like, put the shit back in the car. Mm. And then when he asks you what's really going on, and you're kind of brutally honest about like where you're at in your life, but it's masked in humor. Like we were talking about your character sort of archetypally as a jester. And, uh, you know, and then you, you give him a big smooch on the head and like, he's like sort of chagrined and smiled, like he's affected, but he's like, he can't get out, you know what I mean? And then the third time, the hard sell, you know, it's like, then he opens up and, you know, he's, he's gone at that point, it seems like. Yeah. It's a tough balance to strike. I think um, I'm gonna make a comparison, you know, that they, there's this idea particularly with actors, but I think any artist this could be applied to, that um, if you believe the good reviews, you have to believe the bad as well. Mm. Uh, I don't know how relevant that's going to be to what I'm about to say, but it seemed at the time like a good gateway. We'll find out. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, you know, moments like that, what I, I think I think of it um, maybe in slightly different language than you, John. I, you know, in, in the way that you talk about it as being a potential turning point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess in the process, I resisted the idea of thinking that there's anything we could have, been could have done. Yeah, yeah. Um, that this, you know, that this decision, however the world or Richard Adler wants to um, see it psychologically, that it was all within this shooter, you know, because as soon as you start to believe that there's something we could have done to prevent it, then it, you get into that messy area of, well, if we could have done something to prevent it, could we or did we do something to encourage it? Um, and so in moments like that, I tried to be as authentic and genuine and present with David as possible, but I didn't, 
look at those moments as potential turning points for him. The way I read the text was there's, you know, it's, there's no balance of agency between the partiers and the shooter, that this is just the shooter uh, making his decisions and taking those actions. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I hear you loud and clear. And I, I feel like for me, I was rooting, you know, as I always do, you know, root for uh, the underdog, so to speak, and the person who's, you know, having a difficult time to actually turn the corner and being a, a person is, you know, in drug and alcohol recovery for, uh, you know, ex an extended period of time. I mean, I, I watch the stories, you know, he loves to brag his date. I give it 30 seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I really, uh, I really root for the underdog. I mean, I'm that, I'm that person, you know, who had to turn that corner and change things, you know, and I've seen it happen and see it happen all the time. And it's so, uh, it's powerful for me. So I know, you know, in it, as within any art or being an audience member, or even, you know, from the perspective of being a, a creative person, you're reading so much of your own um, personal feeling and narrative into things um, when you're creating. And you just hope that it, it somehow, you know, has meaning for other people, even if it's interpreted in a different way. Um, sure. Yeah. There's such chemistry in that scene too. Like, like the way he smiles is like, there's this like chagrin and, there's like, it's, um, it's the closest to happiness that you see like on his face in the whole thing, you know? And, um, and your mm. character like just reminds me of like a lot of people that me and John have known over the years that, you know, intrepid travelers, whatever. Um, let me ask you guys this, cause like I've never met you before, but just when you first came on, like the, um, the really good attributes that I saw on the screen in your characters, like I could kind of see in both of you. Do you think that, um, you know, this is maybe a corny question that you get asked a lot as an actor, but um, like how much of yourself did you bring to that? Like, you know, in terms of personal experience, because like when, when me and John talked about this, you know, because it's a tightrope of a subject to get, to get into, but everybody's been to that party, you know what I mean, at some point. I mean, not that it got shot up, but like everybody's been, you know, at a house party at like, you know, three in the morning and, you know, talking about whatever, wherever it leads to, rake room. Do you make the rake room thing up too? No. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just wondering like how much, um, you know, like, like with Hannah, there's a genuine compassion and a, and a self-awareness, like, you know, the whole, like, I'm doing this ironically thing I thought was fucking hilarious. And, um, you know, and Connor, like your personality just seems very similar to Link in terms of just, you know, um, very much like, um, like a facilitator between, of conversation between people or people communicating, you know? And then, yeah, I just was wondering about that, I guess. Sure. Are you going to go? Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I have to imagine that's that's some of the reason that I was cast in this role. Um, I There are actors who, I don't, to be honest, I don't know what most actors do, how they do, what they do, uh, but there certainly are very uh, publicly transformative performances. Daniel Day-Lewis comes to mind as a, an obvious or an easy example. Um, uh, it's not really a thing that I've ever done. I'm not opposed to it. I'll give it a shot. But generally, I I really don't want to, like, you know, show my homework and reveal just how uh, mm -hmm. simple you know, I don't need the secret sauce recipe. But I, mean, it's, it's I just really kind of, like, say the words and stand where they tell me to stand. And... Uh, you know, there's a, I hope to make the work, I want the work I do to be honest and authentic and real. Um, and for me, the way that I go about that is to just, it, it I, I guess it, I guess I am oversimplifying it because it's not just me in other circumstances, but I think that there is commonality between me and the characters that people ask me to play. Um, and 
for me, I prefer to draw on that commonality and find what is shared because I, it helps me it be honest and I'll take all the help that I can get. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fully agree. Um, I think, yeah, this character for me, I remember reading it and feeling like it wasn't, there were a lot of aspects of it that weren't necessarily me, but they were people that I knew. Um, and, um, yeah, I, yeah, various people that I drew on specifically. And I remember like working on the script and after going in for the first reading and coming home and being like, I really feel like I want to work on this because I just feel like I know, I know her and I know this person. Um, and that was, I, I couldn't really put my finger on what that was specifically that was different from other other roles um but that's that's kind of where it came like in terms of the subject matter and the, mm -hmm. the specific stuff um but then generally like as a human um i think as a human and as an actor just being curious about people and how they're feeling didn't wasn't a stretch in terms right. of reaching out to um david's character and um like yeah and and it, to go back to your earlier point about him secluding himself, um, you know, whatever, however that was for him, it was it definitely was a different experience interacting with him versus interacting with everyone else that, um, you know, we were hang, all hanging out and like lying around together all day. Um, yeah. And he had an energy that on set and the, this whole concept of that we, he didn't want to talk to people or we weren't supposed to talk to him or what. It was one like that. So yeah, I get, think I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I was, it was fun when we like the scenes, the times I did get to talk to him on camera was like, wow, I have so many questions. You're right. 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 About right. What's going on with you. Um, mm. That definitely helped. Yeah. So you say that because when I first read the script, I like, I could feel the potential of it immediately, like that it could be something bigger than than the than the parts. You know what I mean? And um, you know, and the casting just made 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 it magic. Like um, there was such a vibe between all you guys, and um, and it just it seemed absolutely real to me. And um, and like I said, it just reminded me of like a million parties I've been at, you know, in the Northwest or wherever. And, um, you know, and people I've met along the way. And, um, and, and, you know, and, and as I, as we got into to production and, um, you know, I started to see bits and pieces and then saw a rough cut. I was just like, wow, it just blew me away. Like it, it's it's pretty amazing how it all came together. And I'm curious, um, like how you guys feel about it, you know, now that some time has gone by, cause like, you know, like it's definitely been a journey, like with our first distributor, like burning down after our neighborhood got shot up, ironically. Um, wow. But yeah, yeah there's, there's that, a lot of backstory there for sure. Uh, not here about that. every every inflection point with this film there was a fucking like national news shooting like every everyone it was crazy um but i'm just curious like you know um like seeing it you know as a as a finished as a finished piece of art like um like how it made you feel you know to be part of it and also as you know in the audience which definitely, I was thinking about this in this call, actually. I think that I had this realization that it is, well, you know, I made a joke about 2001, but I think, I feel like I auditioned for this in maybe 2010. So maybe 10 years before. Well, we we're, we're, we're in Trump years now. So that's a <laughs> good point. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, co Trump COVID years are, you know, eight times long. But yeah, maybe 2011, but I, I don't 
feel like it was any later than that. I feel like it's gotta be 2010 or 2011. So this really is a, uh, for sure the longest running, uh, not longest running, but the, the project that has now been in my life for the longest stretch of time. Right, right. Well, there were so many, um, <clears throat> you know, interesting curveballs that came our way in the process of making this. I mean, I, I look at it from the perspective of my first moments with Jager at the Ugly Mug Coffee Shop uh, in the university district, this little hole in the wall, you know, that students would uh, go to and congregate when I read the, um, the script or actually after I read the script and we talked about it in early draft form. And then a couple of years from that point, um, we started the casting and, and uh, financing process and then um Jager, Jager became ill and that put everything on hold all of the momentum for the film and then um after he healed up and was cancer free we um started to create the momentum again and you know connor you've done some producing you know what it's like you know to make a movie and to um have momentum behind something and then to have to uh, possibly you know uh, restart it and get it moving um, and I in have that pretended to be a producer a couple of <laughs> times. Hannah is, as far as I know, full day, full time producer. Really, you are Hannah. I didn't know that. Pitching. You have a, you own a production company. Unless I'm He's not a braggart. Well, well, um, not. I wouldn't say, you know, it. it well, nothing's that full time. I try. Right I try. But um, yeah, but I, not. I've never done a feature, so that's a whole other. Mm -hmm. length of commitment and time yeah so, so basically just the the second restart and the the push to get it uh um to get it shot was um you know just such an intensive process with respect to a feature and then going through um our um interaction with the state of washington washington filmworks and going through that process of um going into a new program the innovation works and um, it's merit-based, so we had to wait till we were selected in order to find out um, how much uh, funding and resources we could count on from the state to assist us in the, um, in the process of uh, creating the budget. That, so that was like a whole other chapter of the making of the film. And then, um, you know, there were so many, um, of course, serendipitous moments in terms of the process of getting the film mounted and, of course, a million favors, you know, that were done by people who were supporters of, um, of uh, you know, my work and the concept of the film um, that really came to bear. And one of the most interesting ones, I don't know if I ever shared this with you guys. I don't know if I've talked about this with, uh, with you, William, but. You don't tell me shit. <laughs> we, Did you tell uh, who he tried to cast me as? Oh yeah, I did. I tried to cast William. Ray oh. McRaperson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Devin, Dev, Devin's uh, role. I, yeah, I, and I forget how you tried to sell me on it, too. Your hard sell. I'm like, give me a break. <laughs> I'm um, never forgiving you for that, dude. You, you would have been great. You would have been great. Um, so when we were putting the film together, um, I had uh, my friend Rich Cowan <laughs> at North by Northwest Entertainment um, was going to provide the, uh, the red camera for us. And um, I remember when he was on the phone with our uh, DP, Mike Sullivan, um, talking about what lenses they were going to use. And um, they first started discussing Zeiss lenses. And then um, all of a sudden, uh, Rich said, well, we've got some Cook lenses. And there was dead silence on the phone. And I'm a producer, so I know a little bit about a lot of things. I didn't really understand what Cook lenses meant. And then Mike just said, you know, very quietly, he said, I'd like to work with those. And there was more silence. And then Rich kind of paused and said, well, I've got a you know, assemble them, they're in different spots, and I got to have them refreshed, and, you know, I'll see what I can do. So cut to about maybe two weeks later, and this is literally two, two days before the production started, um, I get a call from Rich on my cell phone, and Rich is like, well, John, you know, I'm at the airport in Spokane, I'm getting ready to ship the lens case out to you in Seattle with the camera, and uh, I never asked you, you know, what's the insurance binder on your film? And I told him, and he's like, you're going to need to double that. And in that flash moment, I realized what the cook lenses actually meant um, because um, that type of glass that was created back in, I guess, by hand in the fifties and the early sixties is just absolutely irreplaceable. You cannot replace it. So that was like a huge win on the technical level for the film 
um, given the small budget that we had. And it really um, helps the film play, well, not helps the film, boost the film to playing in a theatrical environment. Because the first time I got the full glory of the film was our second screening at SIF um, in the 400 person theater, um, theater one at the uh, Uptown Cinema. And I uh, saw, you know, a really big uh, screen presentation of the film. And um, I'll never forget the impact because we went down for the Q&A and uh, uh, Dustin Kaspar was the um, uh, programmer who um, was uh, leading the Q&A that night. And when I turned to take the microphone from him, there were tears streaming down his face. And I realized, wow, you know, the film has really impacted the audience because you never know you know, as a filmmaker, you're unsure. You hear people maybe shift in their seats, maybe not, um, but you don't really, you don't really know. And, and that was the moment I knew we had something in terms of the impact of the film. So yeah, there's some behind the scenes producerial stuff for you. That's funny you saying that, because I remember at, um, at SIF, the screening that I went to, um, it wasn't the one for, um, you know, the one with Adler, but the one, that I was sitting next to you, John, and I went out in the hallway, mm. like right before the credits rolled, and everybody that came out was like joyous. Like nobody was like, oh, dude, what a bummer. Like everybody was just joyous, you know? And I don't think it's just because of like Anya's art and like the weed song kind of rocketing off, you know? I think it's because of you know, the vitality of, of that scene that you guys, your two characters very much so brought to the film that made it about the people that were affected right. instead of what happened. You know, which has been really hard for us as, as producers to like, you know, kind of elevate or pitch it because it's like, yeah, it's about a shooting, but it's, you know, it's, but it's cool and it's funny and it's introspective and, you know, it doesn't lend itself to, um, you know, like Twitter or fucking whatever. Yeah. Am I swearing too much for PR? I'm sorry. Is that bad? <laughs> no, it's real, I'm man. Glad to do that. Yeah. Okay, just, just checking. Perfect. Um, yeah. And one thing, you know, that popped in, because you mentioned the Ween song. Um, I wrote about this today on um, uh, social media a little bit because just happened to be in this one of the threads that we were sort of managing um, with the film from the perspective of a, uh, people, you know, uh, the film created controversies as a result of having um, a fair amount of screen time devoted to um, David's character, the murderer. And um, some of that um, with the community of people who knew um, survivors um, did not um, play well for them. And so they've been um, uh, very quick to judge the film. Some have not even seen the film, but um, that process in social media we just decided, you know, a while back, beginning with a the theatrical opening, we were not going to mute any of the comments. We we're just going to allow them to sort of, um, you know, speak their piece on social media. So um, just today, a couple of people had started talking about um, uh, Jeremy Martin, who was one of the inspirations. Now, none of the characters, I mean, I'm sure as you know, Jagger shared with you, um, on the rave side are one for one representations of any people that Jagger knew. They're sort of composites. But um, Link, your character, Connor, had um, definitely um, was drawn, you know, uh, primarily from Jeremy, Jeremy Martin. And um, what I wrote about today was um, one of the um, people on the thread was talking about how Jeremy had impacted their lives because they knew him. A few people chimed in, actually. And then I mentioned that um, when we were doing closing credits of the film, um, we were in the final mix stage and we were up against the clock because we had to, uh, you know, finish uh, the film. And we were not sure about um, what music would close the film. And we were having a really hard time making decisions. And I kept, you know, being a diligent producer, throwing up cue after cue for um, Jager from, you know, music supervisors and other sources and nothing was working. And I was just starting to freak because we were running out of time and we had to have something. And then, um, I think Jager remembered and brought up the playlist that had been shared with us, maybe even shared with Jager um, from Jeremy Martin that we had um, uh, collected um, and, and held on to. So we immediately looked at that playlist and that Ween song, Flutes of Chi, Chi just jumped off the page, like right into our lap. And um, that's how Flutes of Chi ended up in the film. 
from Jeremy's playlist. And I posted on that today in, uh, in social media with a copy of that playlist. So um, yeah, that was, uh, um, you know, pretty amazing uh, moment when that spirit of him as exemplified by his music reached through time um, and through, you know, the veil of life and death um, to our film and, uh, and close the movie sort of the final word, the final song. Yeah, it was, there was like an exuberance, but it was, there was, it was hope, you know what I mean? And it's crazy, like that being on the playlist, like the thing that trips me out, like if I had seen this on Netflix or something, like I instantly go to Wikipedia, because like whenever I see based on a true story, I'm like, really? Like how much? And so much of it, like the narration being from the dude's letter, and like the name of the rave and him shooting up the moose and just all these details that if you came up with as narrative devices <laughs> wouldn't right. even work as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and it's crazy. It's so, uh, you know, it's, um, it just works so well. <clears throat> well, bring and, it, bring it into the present. Cause we, we've got a, you know, a few more minutes um, before we uh, wrap um, I'm wondering how you guys feel about um, how the film, you know, because it has had a really long gestation period, um, how you feel the film, you know, um, plays in today's world. I mean, this COVID environment, something obviously we never anticipated. But that's um, what I was getting to. Yeah. And how, like, you know. Because the, the second screening, the last lady from the audience, like, was fucking heated and it was still not even a scar, I think, in Seattle, you know, this, this whole event. And I think a lot of people heard there was going to be a movie about it and, and wanted, like, a box to put their, their feelings in. Like, you know, he has mental illness, guns are bad, whatever, whatever. And the film is so much more complex than that. And because I remember, because I stood up and made some comment, like, you know, before they closed down the Q&A about how it was like too, you know, myriad of a subject to like, you know, put in, in a, you know, 124 characters or whatever. But, um, you know, you know, with the pandemic, there was actually sort of a break in the ubiquitous, you know, mass shootings, especially at schools. Mm -hmm. But it is such an everyday event now. So I, that's what I was curious as to how that plays to you not so much with the event portrayed in the movie, but stuff that's happened since then, like, you know, with the March for Our Lives and, you know, because there's, there's been such a huge shift in the country, I think, especially since George Floyd too, which isn't like a mass shooting thing, but I think just in terms of, um, you know, just, just love over, over fear, for lack of a better, uh, better way to put it. I think that was my favorite review of it. Uh, what was that? The stranger who said it was um, the perfect, perfect tale for the Trump age of, and rural rage. What was that, John? Remember that? Yeah, yeah. That, that's the that's the quote from uh, I think Charles Mudede and the Stranger. Yeah. Yeah, because like it really like speaks to like how the country got bifurcated, and and sort of exploited along along these lines, and guns are such a big part of that, and. Um, you know, and you guys are both, you know, obviously through your craft and are talking to you as people like, um, you know, feel things very em empathetically. So I'm curious, like, how you relate the film to, you know, what's happened since then and what's going on now. Well, <laughs> let's say start this one. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's all, connected and you know it just kind of shows what we value you know in this country um in terms of like yeah to me it feels very connected to what's happening now and defunding the police and like what where we are putting our money if we're putting our money into mental health or if we're putting it into um weapons and militarization um, and if, you know, we're looking at society out of fear of like the evil that people will do and 
how to manage that as opposed to giving people tools to, um, you know, be happier and healthier. I love that answer. Mm -hmm. Healing. Let's go. I think that's a phenomenal answer. I'll, I'll try to supplement and support it uh, a bit. Just, just say what you feel, man. Um, I, so I, was, I have not seen this film play in Seattle. Uh, so I kind of, I'm also not on Facebook. So there's a lot of yeah, me neither. response to this film um, from the community that I have not been aware of. But it does sound like the reactions are uh, really span the spectrum. And I, I think that that is the cool and scary and um, heavy responsibility of a filmmaker that, you know, at, when a film is released, I do believe that each individual audience member that watches it brings to it their story and, and what they take from it is as valid as the next person, whether or not that corresponds with the attention of the filmmaker. Um, and I know that the story that I bring to the movies that I watch and the movies that I make, really anything that I do, is the story of growing up um, as a white dude in this country and just bubbling over with privilege at every intersection of my life. And there's no way for me to take off that lens. There are a million things that I can do that I have to do that I want to do every day to try and examine that privilege and to try to deconstruct that privilege uh, for myself and for white supremacy as an institution in this country. Um, but that that is even in that process of anti racism and unlearning that is still the lens with which I interact with the world and, and every day I, I find new uh, microaggressions that I've been committing against uh, women against people of color against immigrants and the list goes on and on um i think i may be uh getting a little well, too deep now um but i guess my my thought in terms of how it connects just comes back to that idea of each person bringing their own story that story being a reflection of their experience as viewed through the lens of their everything yeah i dig that i like that i um I actually dated a woman who's a professor at, at uh, UW now in African American studies and um, read all her books. And I remember reading this thing about, you know, being white and male being born into this lattice work, work of privilege, you know. And I grew up in this like bougie part of Connecticut, um, you know, and I hated those fucking guys, um, you know, and I thought like I was like super different and stuff. But then I thought about it, you know, and it's like Chris Rock says in that thing, you know, about the indigger and black or about the one legged janitor, you know, he's like, I got to stick with the white thing a little longer, see where it takes me. But um, yeah, I mean, that's so funny. Like, you know, the fact that the guy came from Whitefish and like so much of the whole alt right thing like came out of there. And it's, I mean, there's so many coincidences with this film that like echoed out you know, not just with shootings, but like politically and, and socially. And um, I just, I'm really proud of you guys, like, you know, John for making it happen. And, um, and both of you guys' performances. So like, just really touched me and amazed me. And, um, and the thing that, I, you know, I brought up that thing about that lady in Seattle, like it's very raw there because it happened there, you know, but it's a film that makes you pause and think you know and reflect because it doesn't have an answer it just you know it, it makes you look at at things and look at yourself like you were just talking about Connor and um you know and your guys's performances were um I don't know why I'm stumbling over that word so bad today um we're just so can you know we're paramount for that to happen like they it's funny that I ended up on a call with you two because um first time I saw it and last time I saw it, those were the two characters that I was like, I know them, you know. So thanks for um, for killing it. Wait, that's not the right way to say it. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. blown away, you know. Fuck <laughs> on. Well, um, you know, the the sort of my last uh, thinking and connector for you guys, um, 
you know, other than telling you how thankful I am that you were part of the cast and you were able to, you know, offer your, um, your craft and your inspirations um, to the whole, the film unit and your, and your fellow actors um, is, uh, you know, one of the things that I hope for when I'm in the process of making film, whether it's documentary or if it's fictional narrative, um, whatever I'm doing, um, I'm always hoping to create a state of immersion for the audience. And um, in order to do that, you've really got to, um, you know, tell a good story. And then you also have to have um, elements, particularly obviously in fictional narrative that have um, the ability to um, prolong people's suspension of disbelief and hopefully give them, you know, points and people that they can identify with. And you guys just did such an amazing job of being giving of yourself and uh, with other actors that uh, you helped um, create that immersive experience for the audience with the film. And um, that to me is sort of where the, you know, if there's any transformation we go through as audience members when we're, you know, there's, an, there's a finite amount of film and narratives we're gonna experience in this lifetime. So, um, you know, in the creative process and making one, I always feel really blessed when I have the ability to really know kind of into my cellular level that uh, we created something that really takes people, transports people to another place and maybe gives them an opportunity to experience some um, life from another point of view. And, uh, you know, you guys are integral to that. So um, thank you. Yeah, thank man, you, you guys are the stitching in like a comfortable jacket that's always going to be comfortable. Like that movie is always going to like be inhabitable, you know, and hopefully like look back maybe 10 years from now and be like, wow, that was, things have changed since then, you know. But I, I do think that, you know, like, approaching it from a heart level like that is how to to really get people to think about this stuff and like you know just polarizing sides more and um you know the nuance that you guys brought to it was just sick so thanks yeah and, and so before we break um hannah um what are you doing now is there anything you want to talk about in terms of are you hiring developing or I, working I spend on? all my money on a movie that i'm waiting <laughs> to yeah you know I gotta say, I have a lot of time alone in my house planned um, for the near future. Um, okay. And beyond that, you know, I'm looking at um, November and um, thinking about what, what, you know, what can be done uh, between now and then. You need some art for you all. If you email me your address, I'll, I'll send you something. Yeah. In yep. yeah, yeah, Watch yeah. out for William. Watch out. Yeah. I got a lot of white happening. So, you know. It's, it's more it's, of a taupe. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Connor, what do you got going on, man? Just trying to dismantle white supremacy. <laughs> oh, just that. Yeah. And also, one, you know, one hug at a time. play a bunch of video games at the same time. <laughs> uh, you got to be my 12-year-old. I love you. All right. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, everybody. Uh, amazing talk. Lots of uh, awesome uh, moments to uh, share with the world. We'll be putting this out um, uh, slowly but surely, maybe in some choice uh, pieces and then in, in its entirety also for uh, people to uh, enjoy online. So thanks again. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.